it is remarkably an incredibly important concept that is at the heart of our theories of how the universe and how matter behaves and yet we don't understand it. We can't measure it, we can't observe it and that's not because our instruments aren't good enough, it's just fundamentally built into the theory. We cannot see a wave function. That's a cool symbol. It is a cool symbol indeed, so it looks like a, looks like a pitchfork. At the very microscopic scale the world becomes very fuzzy. Um, and so particles that, you know, that we like to think of, electrons and protons, that we sort of like to think of as little billiard balls, don't behave that way at all. They, don't, they no longer have a well-defined position in space, for example. They kind of spread out a bit. And you can't say in a very fundamental way exactly where a particle is. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here. And so the only way you can actually express um, that, you know, that physically what's going on is to associate a probability. You say, well, you know, it's a high probability that it's here and there's a low probability that it's here, but you can't say for definite exactly where a particle is. And the wave function is just really the mathematical way of expressing that probability of where the particle actually is in space. Oh, the wave function is the version of quantum mechanics invented by Erwin Schrödinger, and it's uh, a complex quantity, which I don't want to go into, but actually the wave function is related to the probability of finding a particle somewhere. It's, our quantum theory has at its core, and the wave function has at its core, the idea of an imaginary number, the idea of the square root of minus one. And so we are using, it seems absolutely mad to somebody who isn't a mathematician or a physicist, it seems bizarre, and it is mad in some respects when you think about it, that we're using imaginary numbers, square root of minus one, something that cannot exist in the real world to describe reality. And that's, that, that's absolutely remarkable. And so we can certainly on a computer plot out, we can take molecules and we can look, maybe if you want to come over here, we can plot out. And this is actually some work from collaborators in, in Cork in something called the Tyndall Institute. And I have to thank somebody called Jakob Barron for this. But what you can see here is, is a molecule. In this case, it's C60. C60 is a wonderfully symmetric molecule. It's like a, um, basically a molecular football. And we can take that map and we can convert that mathematically into a map that then tells us what the probability of finding an electron is. What do those blobs represent then? And so those blobs represent the wave function itself. Represent, well here, the wave function's positive, here the wave function's negative, here's how the, the wave function spreads out across the molecule. Why should you introduce this wave function when in the world we live in, the world with everything is uh, large scale and uh, cricket balls, especially for Australia that swing around the place, or uh, classical objects such as a book that can fall on your foot. It, it doesn't really matter whether you're using uh, any other language. You're always going to think of these as material objects. But when you get down to the tiny, the very small, such as an electron or a neutrino, you have to describe it in terms of a wave function because it is not... Pri um, it, it's obeying a completely different set of laws of motion. And it's when you go from the very small and you aggregate these particles together that out of that emerges the classical world in which we live. So it's hidden from us because we only see things on a large scale. But I certainly get be to see those huge paintings by Monet. Enormous things that cover a wall, and as you go close to it, you can see it's all blurry and fuzzy. And in that sense, when you go back from the picture, you see the garden or the water lilies. And, and if you're up close, you magnify it closely. It hasn't got the behaviour of being a, a classical picture. It has the impression of being broken up into little daubs here and there. And, and the genius of Monet was to be able to have a huge picture on the wall, enormous, much bigger than the, the size of one of these walls, and to stand back from it and see how he could go forwards and paint a little daub there and it would add to part of the picture. I can't imagine how he can do that. Well, in quantum mechanics, it's a bit like that. You have to stand back from it, look at the whole picture, and then imagine that you can put a little daub somewhere, the quantum mechanical wave function, such that when you go back to the realistic world, you, the world we live in, I mean, the world we live in, not the realistic world, the world we live in, then this little quantum mechanical wave function could add up to an atom inside a cricket ball or an electron inside a cricket ball and become the microscopic object we normally see. What is wave function? It is remarkably an incredibly important concept that is at the heart of our theories of how the universe and how matter behaves and yet we don't understand it. 
Physicists really have struggled for um, very many decades to try and get to the bottom of what wave function represents. We can't measure it. We can't observe it. And that's not because our instruments aren't good enough. It's just fundamentally built into the theory. We cannot see a wave function. We can see things related to the wave function. And in particular, a key thing is that a wave function gives us a measure of probability. And so we can, for example, make wonderful plots like this, you know, something along these lines, where we can plot out on a computer. And computers are great at, at, at working out wave functions, but even then they have to make lots and lots of approximations. And these type of plots can tell us, well, what's the, there's a bigger probability of finding an electron here than here. And as you can see, you've got this wave-like character. And that, what we have are probability waves. Some people describe them almost akin to, to crime waves. So we've got a relationship between the wave function and probability waves. And you can take a wave function, and from a wave function, you can calculate probabilities for finding things. Why do they liken them to crime waves? That's interesting. So instead of, um, I guess the key thing is that there's a, 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 you could think of this as sort of being a, a map, for example. And here we've got a large probability of finding crime or finding um, an electron similarly here, 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 and here. So there are certain localized regions where it's, it's more probable to find a certain type of event occurring, either electron being there or crime. So the, 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 we've talked about elsewhere on 60 symbols. Um, we've had videos related to photons and we've had videos related to, for example, frequency. We've talked about matter waves, for example. And many physicists, myself included, on many occasions will think of a, a photon as a little ball, um, a little cricket ball or, or, or a billiard ball and it carries some momentum. But the difficulty is, it's not really like that. And similarly, when we have, um, we can talk about waves of, and matter waves, and we can think about electrons having wave-like characteristics, but is it really that the electron somehow um, spreads out, breaks up into bits? It's not quite like that either. And we really have not got our heads around exactly what that wave function means. And there have been countless debates Um, including um, a very, very famous one between Einstein and Bohr. So Bohr was one of the architects, like Einstein, one of the architects of quantum mechanics. And um, he and, and Einstein continually argued about, well, what does the wave function mean? And moreover, what do we do when we actually measure something? And Bohr had this wonderful statement which said, which, where he said that truth and clarity are complementary when it comes to quantum mechanics. What did he mean by that? Well, we can put, to, put forward a very simple explanation which seems relatively clear, like a photon is a, is a ball or like an electron spreads out like a wave. But that, might, that is not getting us the full truth. That's getting us some part of the way. The problem is if we want to get to the truth, well, we've not arrived at the truth yet. Physicists really don't understand um, uh, the sheer weirdness of quantum mechanics. So it's a question of measurement as well. So we have this wave function which tells us how the electron spreads out or the probability for finding an electron at different positions in space. And then we make a measurement and what we say is we collapse the wave function. We say, well, okay, it's got a probability of being here, 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 here. And then we might make the measurement and we find that the electron is here. Okay. But what's remarkable is that it, it's a question of, well, what does it really mean to make a measurement and why? There is nothing really in the theory that says we should be forced into a particular position of the electron. What is it that, 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 that um, takes this wave function and instead of having this spread out probability of here, here, why do we get a particular result? And that's an extremely tricky question. And the, the current understanding on that is that when, you inter when a small object like an electron interacts with a large object, that you, um, the large object is like basically taking a jackhammer or a sledgehammer to, to try and, and measure the position of the electron. And that this trying to um, use something very big to measure the position of something very, very small means that you, you disturb the system and you collapse the wave function in a certain state. That would be okay, but that doesn't quite get it. Similarly, with the, there's something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that says that if you know the position of something, of an electron very, very accurately, then you have very, very little knowledge of what its, actually moment, what its momentum is and vice versa. And the, one of the views is that, well, the, the, the problem is 
when with, with the, the, the uncertainty, the natural uncertainty that arises um, in these systems is somehow related to the fact that um, when you're trying to make the measurement, you've got lots of photons coming in, for example, and you're trying to, to pin down where an electron is, and you're, you're kicking that electron all over the place. It would be nice if that, were the, if that was all there was to quantum mechanics and the measurement problem. But unfortunately, that's not all that there is. This, put aside the measurement for one, for one second. This idea of what we call delocalization, of the electron being spreading out um, and having a, a different probabilities at different positions, is, is fundamentally b built into the theory because we're dealing with the theory of waves. And waves, we can think about. A ball has a definite position, a well-defined position, but a wave doesn't. A wave spreads out. And even if you take aside the, 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 the question of, of, of measuring this, that is, that is inherent in the theory. The fact that you've got, instead of rigid objects, you've got objects or you've got waves that spread out in space. But it gets even more um, complicated and more mind-blowing in that one of the most popular, one of the most, um, one, sorry, one of the most interesting, one of the most important aspects of physics um, research, quantum, quantum physics research at the moment, is something called entanglement. And that's a really, really weird effect. So photons, um, we can take, for example, sunglasses, if we take a pair of sunglasses, Polaroid, for example, sunglasses. You realise you've got about 20 seconds here, by the way. Uh, okay. Key thing is you've got two photons, you can put those photons in a wonderfully um, uh, mixed state called an entangled state where they're linked to each other and yet um, they, uh, you, you don't know, nah. Thanks for watching. Please share and subscribe. It will help the promotion of this theory.